All right, hello and welcome to Chemistry Lab. Today we're going to do the lab entitled Reaction Rates and Chemical Equilibrium. And this will encompass six different steps. And uh, there's a lot of data to keep track of, so make sure that you pay attention. Uh, the first part of the lab is A, factors that affect the rate of a reaction. And part A1 is testing the effect of temperature on the rate of a reaction. So we're going to start out with our two test tubes. And in the back, you can see two beakers. One is set up as a warm bath, and the other is set up as a cold bath. Uh, the warm bath is a, at about 45 degrees right now. We're waiting for it to get up to about 50. But the exact temperature isn't so important as the difference in temperature between the two beakers. The ice beaker is hovering around five or six degrees Celsius. Now we have two test tubes and we're going to place into each of them 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid solution. We've worked with this before. It's a fairly dilute acid so it's not incredibly dangerous. And we get ourselves 10 milliliters, and we pour it into our test tube. And then we do it again for our other test tube. Now, the procedure instructs us to put one of the test tubes into the warm bath, and the other test tube into the cold bath, which we'll do at this point. And now we wait for them to cool down a little bit or warm up. Once they've reached their appropriate temperatures, we will add sodium bicarbonate also known as baking soda, to each test tube, and a reaction will occur, which will be visible. And you, the point is to determine which of the reactions finishes first. Which you'll record in your observation section of your lab report. going to test the temperature of each solution with this digital temperature probe to make sure that we're in the right place. So this solution is about 43 degrees. It's been climbing. And this solution is under 10, just 8 degrees and dropping. So we can now be certain that these two solutions are at the appropriate temperature. Now we immediately remove them from their baths. And we are instructed to put one scoop of sodium bicarbonate into each one. So put into the cold one first and then to the hot one. Notice there's a difference. You can probably tell which reaction is happening more slowly and which one is happening more rapidly. If 
you'll notice here, the cold one still has a lot of solid at the bottom and it is evolving a gas at a fairly steady rate. The warm one has significantly less solid left at the bottom and is producing gas at a faster rate. and there may not be enough hydrochloric acid to send this reaction totally to completion. However, hopefully the main result is obvious to everybody at this point. And this reaction produces just salt and water and carbon dioxide, so you can pour these reactants down the drain no problem. That's part A1. So part A2 of this lab is testing the effect of changing reactant concentration on the rate of the reaction. And the reaction in question here will be the reaction of magnesium ribbon with hydrochloric acid. And so we have three pieces of magnesium ribbon that we add to each uh, one each to each of the test tubes. And then the procedure instructs us to start by adding 10 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid to test tube one. And then recording, beginning a stopwatch to record the time immediately. So we start by getting 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. This is one molar. And then we have our stopwatch here, which I will start as soon as I pour. And and as you can see, there's a reaction occurring. You can see the bubbling is continuing and the magnesium ribbon is getting smaller and smaller. And there's just a tiny bit of magnesium floating around in there bubbling now. And once that's fully react, we'll stop the stopwatch. and it has almost sputtered out and we'll call that one minute and 30 seconds so that's the one molar hydrochloric acid next we're going to add 10 milliliters of two molar hydrochloric acid to this to test tube two and observe the effects there And once again, we will start our stopwatch as soon as we have placed our magnesium. Now you notice there is a 
gas being formed in great amounts coming out the top and you can actually see the, the fumes coming out and you notice that this reaction seems like it's happening a little bit more rapidly. The magnesium is already almost gone and it's gone. 27 or 28 seconds rather or 27.59 to be more precise. So that's test tube two. And now the third and final trial, we will do the same, but with three molar hydrochloric acid. Three molar you have to be careful with because it gets into the point where it's strong enough that it can burn your skin. I guess the same would be true of two molar as well. Some people might wear gloves, but I'm not. So we have our stopwatch here. And we start it at the same time that we add our hydrochloric acid. It's going to be very important to do that this time. Because, as you can see, the reaction is going very rapidly. And all the magnesium is gone in 16.16 seconds. So, that's the three trials. You will record this and analyze it in your lab report. Now, since we used caustic hydrochloric acid in this part of the experiment, we need to dispose of it properly in a waste container. So, we'll pour these individual HCl heavy solutions into this waste beaker. And we have properly disposed of our waste. Okay, part A3 of this lab is testing the effect of a catalyst on a reaction and the reaction in this case is the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So we will begin by taking two milliliters of hydrogen peroxide which fill up this handy dandy graduated pipette and we place two milliliters in each one Now that we've done that, test tube one is going to be our reference, meaning that its appearance is going to be rec is recorded as the standard appearance of hydrogen peroxide. And once we've done that, we need to add each of the different compounds to each of the test tubes in order to determine whether they cause catalysis to happen. So the first one is manganese dioxide, NO2. It says to put a spatula tip of manganese dioxide into the mixture. You can see it is a black powder. So we put a little bit of that in there. And you can see that something is indeed happening. You can see a gas bubbling, and if you look in your lab manual, you can see the reaction for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is two hydrogen peroxide molecules degrading into two water molecules and one oxygen molecule. So it should be easy to identify the identity of the gas. And that is just still going and going. And it looks pretty disgusting as well. So I think we've got the idea for that one. I'm going to move on and do the next part where we drop a piece of mossy zinc into test tube three.
and you can see that there is a distinct lack of reaction occurring. So, in lieu of continuing to watch that for any longer, we're going to move right on to test tube four, which is we are placing a piece, a slice of raw potato, which I just cut. And if you notice, if you look closely, bubbles have begun to form around the raw potato. And this is discussed in your lab manual as the possible source of this catalysis but there's definitely a reaction occurring. And for comparison, we will now add a slice of cooked potato from a can of boiled potatoes. Looks very similar, however, when added to the hydrogen peroxide, there is significantly less noticeable effect. So this could lead to some sort of discussion in your lab report about the possible reason for this. But these are the five test tubes and the effects, the various effects that the additives had on the degradation of hydrogen peroxide. Now, as always, we need to properly dispose of our waste. So we take our test tube contents and pour them into this jar. All right. All right. So, part B of this lab concerns chemical equilibrium in the form of reversible reactions. And part B1, the first reversible reaction we'll be looking at is the dehydration of a hydrate and the rehydration of an anhydrous salt. So, we are going to use a Bunsen burner for this and we're going to cook off the water from hydrated copper sulfate and then add the water back in and we're going to record the change in appearance. So first we light our Bunsen burner. is to use a gentle flame. So we'll adjust it until it's right. That should be good enough. And we have a test tube containing copper sulfate here. Notice its appearance. It is a roughly if you want to do a granular crystalline solid with a bluish color, slightly shiny, and it sticks together in the test tube. If you shake it, it doesn't move. We'll put this over the heat. And if you notice the bottom of this is now turning white. OK, 
can also notice the water droplets forming on the inside of the test tube. And then as the water droplets fall back in, they change the color back. And it's starting to sizzle because the water is being boiled off at an alarming rate. And now you see the difference in appearance between the hydrated copper sulfate and the dehydrated copper sulfate. And then notice the difference. And then if we go ahead and add just a little bit of water, watch what happens to the appearance. It immediately turns blue. more water and it turns all the way back into hydrated copper sulfate. It's a very simple and easy to observe reaction and uh, we record these observations in your lab report. That's part B1. All right, so this is part B2, the reaction of copper two ions with hydroxide to form copper hydroxide precipitate, and then the dissolution of that precipitate with the addition of acid. So part step one says to put three milliliters of copper chloride solution, 0.1 molar, into each of the test tubes. So we'll start with that. Let's see the actual mark there. Note the appearance of the copper chloride solution. Just to be clear, the copper chloride solution has this light blue color to it. Now, step two says to add drops of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide to test tube one and stir until a light blue cloudy precipitate of copper hydroxide forms. And then we add the same number of drops to test tube two. So here's our sodium hydroxide. We'll take a dropper full of it. And we add drops until a blue precipitate begins to form and you can see there there is a slight amount of cloudiness to that solution maybe add a little bit more just for for purposes of so that was about 10 drops or so, and there is a light cloudiness to that solution. So we'll add the same number of drops to, of sodium hydroxide to the other one. And you can see both solutions are slightly cloudy. Now, Procedure says to add to test tube one more drops of sodium hydroxide solution to increase the OH minus concentration and note any changes in appearance. So test tube one is getting more sodium hydroxide. Just to add an arbitrary large amount. And if you notice, the solution has become cloudier. can imagine 
what that means. Now, the step four says to add drops of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid until the precipitate disappears. So we'll do that here. We have our 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. And we add that to test tube two. And if you noticed, the solution is now clear. So this says something about the equilibrium and how it is affected when you add acid or base, and you can answer questions about this in your lab report. That is part B2. And as always, we dispose of our waste properly. So we pour our copper hydroxide solution into here, and our copper chloride here. Okay. Uh, part C is concerned with changing equilibrium conditions. We're going to study Le Chatelier's principle, and we're going to do so using the reaction of iron 3 plus ions with the thiocyanate ion to form the bright or dark red iron thiocyanate ion. And we're going to notice a color change from the yellow of iron 3 plus to the red of iron thiocyanate. So the procedure instructs us to begin by measuring 10 milliliters each of iron nitrate and potassium thiocyanate at 0.1 molar concentration and to place that into a beaker. So that's what we're going to start with. So there's 10 milliliters of iron Chlor iron nitrate, which is orangish in color, and then 10 milliliters of potassium thiocyanate. You notice some of the potassium thiocyanate has already reacted with the iron in the graduated cylinder, which is fine. And we add it to this. Notice the production of a red color in the liquid. And we are now instructed to put three milliliters into each of these test tubes. We're going to eyeball it by just putting a little bit of each. And then well, a little bit more of the ones we don't have as much in. Okay. So now we have our six test tubes prepared, and we're going to shift the equilibrium in a number of ways. So to test tube one, we're adding 10 drops of water as our reference. So, first one, we're just going to add 10 drops of water. Just a little bit of water. And as you can see, not much has really changed about the reactant or the solution color. Now to test tube, test tube two, we're going to add 10 drops of one molar iron and nitrate. And this will increase the quantity of reactants present. So our one molar iron nitrate is darker in color than the original the 0.1 molar was. So this is test tube two. There's 
there's 10 drops and if you'll notice it's a bit difficult to see but that red is now darker than the one with distilled water in it so then to test tube 3 we add 10 drops of potassium thiocyanate to the reaction mixture and observe the effect. And this is also one molar potassium thiocyanate. Now, see, you see, potassium thiocyanate is colorless, but when we add it to test tube three, Now, that had an even more pronounced effect on the color of the liquid. And to test tube four, we are instructed to add 10 drops of three molar hydrochloric acid. So we take our three more hydrochloric acid and we get set up to add drops to it. And this one, if you'll notice, the color has changed in a different direction. And that color change is due to the bonding of chloride ions to the iron rather than thiocyanate ions. So that is part C1, the effect of changing reactant concentration. Now we're also going to test the effect of temperature on this reaction. So you'll notice we still have our hot and cold baths in the background of this um, test tube rack. So what we're going to do is take test tube 5 and put it into a cold bath and then add 10 drops of water and stir. And we're going to take 6 and put it in the warm bath and then add 10 drops of water and stir. So we're going to add water to each of these. And stir. And we're going to wait a minute for the temperature to, we're going to wait actually 10 minutes for the temperature to change until to get to its final resting place. Right there. Okay, so it's been 10 minutes, so now we're going to look at test tubes 5 and 6. Now they've come to temperature. So test tube 5 is shown there. Test tube 6 is shown here. And you should be able to see a difference between those two. Test tube 5 looks a bit darker. Test tube 6 looks a bit lighter. So from that, you should be able to deduce the answer to the question of whether heat causes this reaction to shift more towards thiocyanate or more towards iron chloride. And then we're going to properly dispose of our waste. So, once again, we pour everything into our waste container. <laughs> 